the very thought of replacing the Melbourne Cricket Ground might seem unthinkable today. But this was in fact the dream and near reality pushed by top executives and business people in the not too distant past. Despite well advanced plans, investment and even construction, this attempt to outshine the MCG, spiritual home of Australian football and the centrepiece of Melbourne's claim to be the sporting capital of the world was not to be. In today's video we're going to find out exactly what happened to the Victorian Football League and its grand plans at Waverley Park, and why the MCG still stands strong as a symbol of arguably Victoria's most famous sport. Before we start, I just wanted to mention that this topic was suggested by a viewer, so thank you very much to Ian for getting in touch and for pointing me in the right direction. So if you have an idea, please let me know in the comments below or via my website linked in the description below. Suggestions from you are always very welcome. And now back to the video. Our story starts in 1959, when the Victorian Football League, the predecessor to today's Australian Football League, announced plans to build a brand new state-of-the-art mega stadium out in the rapidly growing southeastern suburbs of Melbourne. There were several reasons behind this move. The VFL complained that almost every ground that they played football on was controlled by another entity, making it more difficult for them to schedule and organise games around other events and priorities. Basically, the VFL wanted a stadium that they owned and controlled. Even the MCG, despite all of its advantages and deep ties with the game, was and still is owned by the Melbourne Cricket Club. The second reason was that they wanted a venue that they thought would be easier to get large numbers of people to and from. The 1950s was the beginning of the era of car dominance after the Second World War, and many in positions of power believed the cars were the solution to transport and urban planning issues. The MCG, being in an inner city location, had limited room to build car parking and did not have much road capacity. Finally, the VFL also claimed that because existing grounds were not purpose-built for Australian football, they experienced issues with the quality of playing surfaces, including drainage and turf. This was to be a somewhat ironic reason, as we'll soon see. These then were the justifications for the VFL buying an 86 hectare site in Mulgrave in September 1962. Back then this was on the very outskirts of Melbourne's rapidly growing suburbs, and agriculture was the main activity around here. After securing the land that they needed, the VFL then got to work on finalising their grand plans, which were very grand indeed. For starters, they wanted to build a mammoth stadium with a capacity for over 157,000 people. This would have made it the world's largest stadium today, and the second largest at the time. Most of this would have been seated capacity, but there would also still be room for standing spectators. This enormous complex included a larger playing field than the MCG, 25,000 car parking spaces, a hotel for interstate teams, swimming pools and even a helipad. And it wasn't just built to cater for football either. Facilities for other sports, like athletics and swimming, were also planned, presumably to help source ongoing funding for the hugely expensive project. Construction began in 1966, and it was officially opened four years later in 1970, even though the rest of the stadium wasn't finished until 1974. The inaugural match was played on the 18th of April 1970, between Fitzroy and Geelong. But given its full size, it wasn't built to its full capacity by this time, and the plan was to expand it more as the years went on. Still, even at its official opening in its half-finished state, it was just about the same size as the MCG at just over 100,000 people. All of this sounds pretty impressive. Unfortunately though, the problems with Waverley Park began almost immediately. For starters, as we just talked about, it wasn't all built at the same time. Even though it was advertised as completed in 1974, there was still a lot of work to do if the original vision was to be realised. This half-constructed state didn't do much to make it look like an attractive place to be or host events. It also wasn't popular with a lot of patrons because it didn't offer very good facilities. For some reason that I haven't been able to find, the ground was built with little seating that was under cover. With AFL being a winter sport, I can't imagine that this was the best idea, especially when other grounds like the MCG were spending big on upgrading their facilities. There were complaints about the uncomfortable wooden seats, the poor quality of the scoreboard screen, and what seemed to be everyone's least favourite part of Waverley Park, the transport situation. This wasn't set up for success from the very beginning. 
trying to get 100,000 people to and from a single location, all trying to arrive or leave at the same time, is not an easy feat. And it's almost impossible when you rely almost entirely on cars. While the VFL promised in its plans that the state government would build a railway to their venue, it never came. The 1969 Melbourne Transportation Plan, which I've covered in a previous video, proposed building a railway to Ferntree Gully from Huntingdale down North Road and Wellington Road, which would have taken it very deliberately right past Waverley Park through a station at Mulgrave. As we know today though, this never happened. This meant that Waverley Park had to rely entirely on road-based transport, with a car park with capacity for over 25,000 cars, taking up much more space than the stadium itself. By my reckoning, this makes it the largest car park ever built in Victoria or even Australia, far bigger than even Melbourne Airport. But let me know in the comments if you know of anything bigger. This reliance on and encouragement of driving led to legendary traffic jams that took hours to clear. Some people reported that they would just leave their car in the car park, go and have dinner, and then come back many hours later to collect it once the congestion had cleared. While some attempts were made to provide shuttle buses at some point, these barely made a dent, as without dedicated lanes, these two just got stuck in traffic. It struggled with its lower capacity of 100,000, so I can't imagine that moving its originally planned 157,000 people using this same system would have even been possible. But despite these issues, the VFL pressed on, as there was also a political element. The MCG obviously didn't want to lose its lucrative and popular football matches, and there was already a history of bad blood between executives of the Melbourne Cricket Club and the VFL, which didn't help the situation. Key figures at the time, which apparently included the Premier of the time, John Kane, were not fans of the VFL's plan to move their matches away from the MCG. They lobbied and worked behind the scenes to keep the home of Australian football at the MCG, scuppering the hopes of the VFL management. Despite these disputes, Waverley Park saw quite a lot of use throughout the next few decades. The first big matches started in the early 1970s, such as the 1972 elimination final between St Kilda and Essendon, and the special Anzac Day match of 1975 between Essendon and Carlton. 1981, though, saw the all-time peak attendance of 92,935 for a match between Collingwood and Hawthorne. By this time, the huge stadium began to be used for other things, including World Series cricket, baseball and music concerts. But not long afterwards is when it started its long and slow decline. While opinion on Waverley Park remains divided to this day, there was a strong perception at the time of the poor facilities. Other than the issues that we mentioned before, the stadium suffered from a lack of shelter, poor maintenance and a location that more or less guaranteed wet weather. One of the nails in the coffin was a match played in the 1993 Foster's Cup between Footscray and Carlton. Heavy rain and the condition of the stadium rendered the ground almost unplayable. Huge mud pits and holes in the grass littered the oval, with any bounces of the ball virtually impossible. Players tripped over or became stuck in the wet ground, making the match incredibly difficult to play, and described by commentators as a cow paddock. But perhaps the most infamous event was the night match played on the 8th of June 1996 between Essendon and St Kilda. This was when a power fault in a nearby substation cut the electricity supply in the third quarter. This plunged the entire stadium into darkness, including the pitch and the player rooms. While officials tried to figure out what to do next, as such an eventuality was not in the AFL rules, groups of spectators jumped the fence and ran out onto the ground, lighting fires, ripping out goalposts and causing damage to the buildings. Eventually the match was abandoned, with the AFL playing two 12-minute halves at a rematch on Tuesday in the following week, which Essendon won. These and other incidents didn't do much for Waverley Park's already waning reputation. The beginning of the end came in 1988, when a deal was struck that designated the MCG as the quote home of football. Part of this deal involved major renovations to the MCG to improve its facilities, mainly for the benefit of the AFL. Finally, in 1999, the AFL announced that it was selling the land, partially to help fund the construction of the new Dockland Stadium. The last match was played in 2000, after which it was more or less abandoned. It was sold for development to Mervac in 2001, and the site's master plan for residential development retained some parts of the grounds. Today the pitch and stadium is a park, with the surrounding former car park now housing for around 3,500 people. 
the Sir Kenneth Luke stand houses offices and a museum for the Hawthorne Football Club, together with some shops and other facilities. You can climb up part of the way to the seats and standing areas to get some impressive views. From here you can imagine just how massive the stadium would have looked with its capacity of 157,000 people. Many of the street names are nods to the former stadium. There are plaques and other information on the site's past, and this huge artwork on the front pays tribute to the VFL and its vision. The towering remains of the stand can be seen for tens of kilometres around surrounding suburbs, even though it's only a small portion of its originally massive size. It has since been heritage listed to recognise its significance as the first large stadium purpose built for Australian football. It also holds the title of having hosted the only AFL Grand Final outside the MCG in peacetime, which was held in 1991. It still doesn't have a railway as originally promised, but the estate does command high property prices. It's a pleasant enough suburban scene, forever overlooked by this massive section of stand, as a constant reminder of its past and the once grand vision for this little corner of Melbourne. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this and would like to see more, please subscribe to my channel so that you can stay up to date on future videos. As always, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time.